So, hello, everybody. Light Collective is really proud to present Dark Room Live. Um, it's probably the biggest live education outreach program the lighting industry has ever seen. Um, we're planning to live stream all the dark talks, uh, dark, live, dark Room Live talks, right here on our YouTube channel, Light Collective TV. We've got an amazing array of speakers. I think there's about 38, 39 speakers talking on a massive range of light-related topics, lasting only 15 minutes. Uh, we're on for two days. That's, um, you can come on down. You can register online at www.darkroom.com forward slash register. I've always wanted to say that, a forward slash. Okay. We My name's Matt Hanbury, I'm a mechanical engineer and I am the founder of Lightly Technologies. Um, today I'm going to be addressing the OLED lighting paradigm. And uh, the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to start off with what's maybe an unpopular opinion. I love OLED lighting. And, uh, and despite not really becoming the commercial success that it was uh, initially put out to be, there are so many reasons why I love this, this form of light source. Um, so, so firstly, just the, the, the very nature of it, the ultra-thin surface light source of OLED lighting lends itself to these incredible installations, um, kind of really bringing together uh, the geometric um, and, uh, and the, all the d design um, freedom that kind of comes with that. Uh, so, for example, this fantastic installation uh, by Blackbody. Um, but it's not just installations, it's all also uh, very simple, um, uh, very modern styles of luminaires, um, such as this uh, Thin Air by Philips. Perhaps one of my favorite installations, though, is this kinetic sculpture. Uh, this was launched back in 2012 and, uh, and, and really brought together so many aspects of OLED lighting. Um, and so in combination with that geometric shape and the ultra-thin uh, surface, um, you, we have a, a fully three-dimensional kinetic moving art installation. Uh, and the, and the, this really um, sums it up. It was art as an extension uh, f from, from lighting uh, in and of itself. Um, but there's also the great applications, very modern desk lighting, uh, completely rethinking the way we can light offices, again, bringing together that combination of geometric and organic curved shapes, um, and uh, very modern uh, designs of luminaires that could only be achieved with a technology such as OLED um, with its ultra-thin surface light source. Minima minimalist designs, uh, taking a, a kind of a three-dimensional approach from a two-dimensional light source. Um, and even IKEA has come in and started developing uh, uh, lo uh, luminaires using OLED uh, due to its, um, its flexibility and uh, the opportunities uh, that, that are only created uh, using, uh, using this form of light source at the moment. Um, and some very simple, elegant solutions as well. And then this is another of my favorite OLED installations. This would be uh, Manta Ray by Sealux. Again, that fusing of square geometric shapes uh, with curved experience with OLED, that ultra thin uh, surface, um, which, which uh, enables um, completely different uh, design opportunities and a design freedom that you just uh, can't achieve with a point source like LED or, or, uh, or a linear fluorescent solution. Um, and then looking at how we can bring together a geometric design and uh, matrices and arrays of, uh, and different combinations for both suspended, uh, surface mounted and, uh, and task lighting applications. Um, so those are, the, those are the things that I love about OLED lighting, but um, as we all know, there are a lot of limitations to, to OLED lighting as well. 
I experienced these uh, firsthand. So I previously worked um, at Philips OLED uh, factory in Germany uh, back in 2013. And so while falling in love with the design opportunities of OLED, I saw, I saw these limitations firsthand. And I would break these down really into two categories. Uh, firstly, in performance. Um, and the, the key areas that uh, OLED are uh, lacked in performance would be light output, so a lot of OLED light sources wouldn't have the light output required for, for truly functional applications and were therefore used just for, for decorative applications. Uh, efficacy was always trailing behind LED technology um, and then also lifetime was significantly shorter than conventional LED technology. All of these things kind of uh, came together to, to, um, to prevent the real commercial adoption uh, of OLED lighting that we were all hoping for. On, on the other side uh, of the limitations, uh, there are a lot of challenges from, from the manufacturing side. Um, and, and again, these are things that I saw firsthand as a mechanical engineer. Uh, the, 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 the top three uh, limitations here would firstly be the materials, the very advanced organic compounds um, and the hydrocarbon chemistry which would go into creating um, uh, the, the organic light emitting diode source. Um, very expensive, newly developed. Uh, yield was also a problem, uh, and so you would uh, take a runoff of production line and you'd often have a high percentage of the OLED modules which would have defects, and the, the cost implications of that get again pushed on to the consumer. Um, and w one of the most astonishing ones, though, was the, the cost of the machinery. So. Um, well, while I was at Philips, they invested in a 40 million euro uh, production line. And within the, the eight months that I was there, they still hadn't fully got it up and running and at full capacity, really showing the challenges of the technology and, and, and why uh, it's always been relatively more expensive than, than, than LED. So having an overview of the design architecture of OLED lighting. Um, so we start with... Uh, uh, a glass substrate. This is typically less than a millimeter thick, um, but uh, surprisingly, is by far the thickest part of the of, of the of the stack of OLED technology. We have the anode and cathode, which essentially uh, control the uh, flow of electricity through the module. Uh, each of these would be about a tenth of a millimeter thick, super thin um, uh, uh, films of, of material. This is nothing in comparison to the organic compounds which actually produce the light though. Uh, these would be on the order of uh, 10 nanometers. Uh, to kind of put that into perspective and just how, th how very incredibly thin this is, if you were to scale a 10 by 10 centimeter OLED up to a kilometer square, that's the equivalent of painting a one millimeter thick layer of paint on that whole surface. Um, and just shows the enormous engineering challenges uh, that went into OLED lighting. Certainly the most advanced form of lighting ever created, um, but, uh, but had these significant challenges of itself. I'm going to take you now to uh, a parallel universe. After working at Philips Lighting, I moved to Japan and I worked for Apple on the iPhone 6S. And I saw something here which is really interesting. Um, there's, there's very little crossover between the lighting industry and the smartphone, display, and smartphone displays industry typically. But both of our sectors have been wrestling with both LED and OLED technologies for our different applications. Uh, something that I, I found really fascinating with the different challenges and the different uh, performance needs. Um, in general, the smartphone sector is amazing. We have this huge accelerated development over the last 15 years from uh, the Nokia kind of feature phones all the way through to the advanced iPhones and Android phones and uh, essentially a computer in your, in your pocket with all of those uh, um, features that we couldn't live without anymore. Um, and so th there's been a, a combination of reasons why the smartphone sector has been so successful, and um, as, as, long as, as well as the other ones of, uh, the, uh, that you would expect of huge uh, phones have developed so well, is through this cross-pollination where companies like Apple and Google, all different sectors, and bring in the learnings from, from uh, different areas to, to develop technologies as fast as possible. 
So a, a quick overview of the difference between um, the displays technologies. So up until recently, most smartphone displays would be LCD, which is liquid crystal display. And the way this would work is you would have um, a, a uniform surface of light which would shine through um, the liquid crystal display and uh, the liquid crystals act essentially as a filter, allowing the light through the different colored subpixels of red, green and blue uh, to, to, to create the final colors in the display. OLED works in a different way, so it doesn't work as a filter. It, the individual pixels and the subpixels light up by themselves, um, and so it, it, it's a totally different way of, of achieving uh, of the same goal of uh, illuminated uh, subpixels. Um, what, what this means with OLED displays is you have much more energy efficiency because you, you're not blocking out the white light, you're creating red, green, and blue individual light colors. Um, and, uh, and so uh, what we've seen is that there's a, been a movement towards OLED technology in the display sector, whereas in the uh, lighting sector, we had OLED lighting maybe um, seven or eight years ago, but it hasn't developed uh, to the point where it... To go into a bit more detail of how LCD displays technology works, we start with a string of LEDs, so something that we very much share with the display sector, and a light guide plate. Uh, this is essentially a, a plastic plate with um, light extraction features, and when the light comes in from uh, the LEDs and hits these extraction features, they're reflected upwards towards the viewer of the smartphone. Um, to, to improve this process, there's a reflector at the bottom which reflects any light which comes down from the light guide plate. It then goes through a diffuser to increase the uniformity and a brightness enhancement film to control the beam angle. Uh, on top of that, we then have the stack of uh, the, the liquid crystal display, which would be the polarizers, the color film, and the, the uh, LCD controller. So, so coming back to the paradigm shift, the, the first thing uh, is to de define uh, what, what is a paradigm. And what we're looking at is, is uh, a, a kind of standard way of working at is, is uh, a kind of standard way of working um, and a, a standard direction that we're taking technology. And it was after I left Japan and I moved to Ireland um, that I, I was reflecting at my time at Philips OLED and also at, um, at Apple and the iPhone 6S. And I realized... Um, the lighting industry needed to have a paradigm shift. The lighting industry didn't need um, a, a light source that used OLED technology. What the, light, the lighting industry needed was an ultra-thin surface light source. And uh, the paradigm shift was understanding there was a different way to achieve that. And that's that I had from the smartphone uh, industry and realized that if we were to re-engineer these advanced displays technology from the LCD displays, which uses LED technology already, we could create this ultra-thin surface light source. And by doing so and by using LED, we could solve those key problems of, um, of, of performance and, uh, and manufacturing cost. And so... We set out with this, uh, with this ambition to revive the vision of OLED lighting. Essentially what we did is we took all of the things that we loved about OLED lighting, the design freedom, the ultra thin surface light source, and, and then we made a list of all the things that we didn't like about it, the low output, the poor energy efficiency and lifetime, and we set about re-engineering um, smartphone displays to achieve this. And so uh, that was uh, two and a half years ago at the end, uh, sorry, at the beginning of, of 2016. And uh, this week we're delighted to uh, launch at Darkroom Hikari Square, which is our ultra thin LED light source. Um, so uh, what we've managed to achieve is uh, a light source which looks like OLED lighting, um, but is 100% LED. Uh, and so with that, we, you, you have all of the design benefits of being able to design um, uh, luminaires and lighting installations which appear to be uh, using OLED technology, but have all of the performance benefits of LED technology. So we have uh, the, the high lifetime light output and, and efficacy. 
And uh, this, is, this is really exciting for us because essentially what it enables us to realize um, is uh, to enable the lighting industry to come back, um, sorry, to enable the lighting industry to come back and, uh, and, um, and enable this new generation of luminaire design and lighting design, which previously we thought was only achievable with, with OLED technology. And uh, an overall, for us, what we see is the moral of the story is that you may have this vision for where uh, you want your final technology, your final product to be, but often you need to have a look again at your paradigm. You need to take a step back and think, are there different avenues, are there different routes that I can take to achieve the same result and perhaps improve beyond what's, uh, what's possible with the conventional technology? Uh, so, thank you. Thank you.
Here I am. Hello, everybody. Um, hello, world. This is very strange to be the first on. Um, so I thought I would, in a very short comments, talk about my latest project, which is part of the London Design Festival, which is Colour Transfer at Paddington Central. Uh, if you haven't seen it, go see it. It's a permanent display, um, and it launched in June this year. I thought I'd give a, a slight journey about how I, um, I spent the last two years talking about this piece of work, which looked absolutely phenomenally huge in my studio and absolutely shrunk when you put it into the space. Um, it's 18 meters long um, and three meters high, but we'll come on to the details in just a few minutes. So this piece uh, was made in 2016 and it was called Our Colour Reflection, um, and it's toured the world now. This was in January at Chester Cathedral, but the curators at British Land, who were the sponsors for the London Design Festival, it's different uh, form, many years before, and they saw images of it online. So the power of the internet has been quite, a, been quite kind to me. Um, they thought it would be wonderful to show this display um, at Broadgate, which is just up the road from where we are. But I had many, many conversations with them, and they thought that it would be fantastic to get me to make a permanent piece. So I was shortlisted. There was three artists on the shortlist, and they wanted an interactive piece where people could walk under the Westway Viaduct, which was a complete dingy, grim, dark space, and they wanted it to be energised and enlivened. They would seen images like this where I'd used LED lights to create completely different environments, immersive environments that challenged people's perception of colour and really had an impact on people's well-being. Except the other two artists were happy to create sensory environments but on a control system. Multi, multi thousand pound displays. Did I mention the budget was 20,000? Uh, very little money with massive ambition. And I said, I want to make something that is static and that challenges our perception, but using our eyes as the lens. Not so much it might change colour or uh, ignite a display. As you can see, quite a lot of my past work is static, although it has light elements, so that I was sticking true to my goals and my voice as an artist. So I came up with this. This is, this is how crude it gets uh, from an artist's point of view. So two years ago to this day, I received a phone call asking me to draw a proposal along with the other two artists. Sadly, they went with another of the artists. And this artist drew up a budget. Now, of course, we all know how much technology costs. And I think it uh, totaled about £200,000. So quite a way over budget. Um, and they came back to me at this point and said, oh, um, the other artist screwed up, basically. Um, and we, we're still really interested in you, Liz no pressure. And I said, well, this is what I'm proposing. I'm proposing a, a fixed wall piece made out of mirrors or super highly polished um, aluminium uh, with coloured tints on them. So as people walk through the tunnel, it changes depending on your angle. Here we are. Um, this is it as it is now. But I'll go and talk a bit about the process in the next 10 minutes. So it's been two years of my life. It launched in um, June this year and has been relaunched as part of the London Design Festival and Paddington's design route. When you see it in an image like this, it looks elegant and simple, slick. You can't possibly imagine the conversations I've had with the commissioners about the complexities of this to share with you in my normal, honest nature. So, I uh, got invited to an interview, and we stood just out of shots where there's some ping pong tables. 
Um, at this point, British land wanted to ignite well-being within the area, and they wanted to put exercise bikes underneath the viaduct. Can you imagine? People cycling on the spot. It's all about fitness and well-being. I'm so happy that didn't happen. Um, I mean, really, <laughs> although this is a very simple drawing, which was done on a, a very small piece of notepaper and photographed on my phone and added to a proposal, which was mainly um, words, they, they didn't actually take anything away from my concept. That It stuck pretty true, which is a nice thing. So it took them a good five months to realize that they wanted this. And in that time, I said, I want um, a stipend to go away and cost this up properly. Um, I don't want to promise you that it's going to be £20,000 because then we could end up getting into the technicalities of it and it costing a lot more and my studio having to take quite a major hit. I also went away and made a scaled maquette because they were not convinced that without any artificial lights that this piece would sing and uh, energize the space as they wanted it to. So I made a maquette using the material with this two and a half meter length maquette and sure enough, the, the mirror was so shiny and so glossy that the light bounced around the space and it changed the dynamics of the space, even with just really um, simple hues and tints. That So we shook hands on that deal on the 17th of March and they awarded me the commission. However, could you make it in the British land colour scheme, Liz? No, I can't. We're concerned that we kind of don't want to give that message to our public. Oh, Jesus. I said, well, I can start uh, instead of red, which for me is the kind of start of the, the spectral rainbow, we can start at green. You know, let's, let's compromise here. Anyway, I was in commission now. I had the gig and I'd costed it at around £50,000. They were happy with that. They thought that was realistic probably should have paid myself a little more. It probably should have been more like a 60, 70,000 pound commission. But at this point, it was going to launch in just four months time. It was going to launch as part of the London Design Festival 17. And here we are a year later. I think what happened was planning permission got in the way. Planning permission took two rounds. The first round, um, the amount of paperwork and documents that had to be sent off I was, at this point, heavily, heavily pregnant. Um, and I said, look, I want to go away on maternity leave and I want to have done all my bits and you can put in the planning permission and I can just have that family time, which is really important. Um, I also said that my husband, who is a, a curator, is going to project manage this from now on um, and take over the reins from me, uh, which he did so. I also said that when this baby comes, if it ever bloody comes, it was two weeks late, um, please do not talk to me for two weeks. Just give me two weeks. The day after I had Francis, the phone was ringing. We need this information, we need that information, we need a technical drawing from your fabricator. You know, it was never ending. And there I was in hospital. So talk about um, a, a life-work balance here. I think as an artist, being an artist, you live and you die an artist. You go to bed being an artist. You don't, um, unfortunately, ever switch off from it. Planning permission brick wall had joint ownership. So they had to put it in. Luckily, it was granted and fabrication could be sorted. And then the realisation that the, um, the fins, the spike of the feet, um, the fins, the spike of the fins were at eye level, and this would probably have potential problems knocking. So, um, it's cut off. Um, very Japanese, very much like origami. Um, and it gave me a chance to play around with colour as you walk under the underpass and add a different dimension to the work. And I think it really adds to it. Uh, this is a traffic canton. This is um, uh, an inspiration for Arva, I guess. Um, this is a, a story a bit about time, after all. 
So a lot of people don't realize that in fact the, the traffic in Canton is a calendar as well as a clock. So it's a clock tower that's placed outside Oslo Central Station. And on Mondays, one of the segments lights up at the bottom. So Arvo would go past every day on the bus and he knew what day it was, he's not stupid, but you know, he had a visual reminder of, of uh, you know, where's mode. Um, he could, he could uh, go home and enjoy the weekend. Um, these are drawings, and I, I mean, I, I understand what the structure looks like now, but I'm not sure if it's very, very um, legible. And you can see the kind of scale, this is person down here, it really is quite a big structure. Um, and I think it's quite difficult to read the, the, the structure internally, so you could actually say that this, the camouflage is doing its job. This is all the stuff that they thought might go inside. Um, so all the pink stuff, you know, as I said, the gantries, the ladders, the structure. We wanted to avoid lighting all of that stuff. Um, so, as I said, from this 2014 study, we, we looked at where we could actually um, place light sources and which elements of, of the structure we should light. So we were looking at, at places where we could locate things. Um, we had to locate that they weren't going to, uh, the light source wouldn't be visible from the roadway below. And of course we wanted to place the light sources so that they wouldn't light the, the structure internally. So the approach was to kind of find areas of, of, the, uh, of the facade where the facets were sort of convex, so standing off the, the structure, where we could actually get the light to pass more freely behind. And we sort of called those the lighting superhighways. And you can see that um, these cells, they're like a, a big, broad, kind of faceted cell uh, within the center of that. Um, we did a lot of modeling on computer. We couldn't do actual uh, physical modeling, and we couldn't do mock-ups. But this is the design that we came up with after having you know, tried a lot by, by computer validation. The, um, the projectors are RGBW, and we've got a big projector, which is quite powerful, and it's got a broad beam. So that's kind of doing the broad brush strokes. That's doing the, the, the larger sort of cell overall. And then there's the smaller, more powerful narrow beam projector on the left, and um, whether, whether this is going to be successful completely or not. Um, this little video, if you kind of watch the light changes, so depending on the direction of the light, um, whether, it's the, the, whether the light is being transmitted through and, and then you see the structure is permeable or whether the, the light is actually on the, the front phase that you're looking at, and then it becomes much more solid. And we wanted to play with the permeability with the light as well. So the images on the right, uh, if you take the middle image, top and bottom for instance, the bottom image, which is red, that would be with the lighting on the inside of the face that you're looking at, and the top image would be the lighting on the inside face on both elevations, so that you're seeing a bit of an interference uh, effect that, that takes place between both of them. Um, it was quite an intense process getting this thing built. And um, you have to bear in mind that this is a design and build project as well. I mean, it is a sculpture, and it is being, you know, it's been designed by this Royal Academician, and he's a really clever guy. But this wasn't built in Conrad's studio. This was actually built by a builder uh, on an actual building site in, in Greenwich. So it had to be, you know, rather than just kind of going there and trying something, it had to be, you know, rather than just kind of going there and trying something, everything had to be really carefully drawn and really thoroughly kind of tested before it could be given to the builder to, to, to um, install. As I said, the, um, the, the money bag was dry. By the time we actually wanted to do some light tests, we couldn't even afford, unfortunately, about a thousand pounds to to light that two meter maquette um, at Conrad's uh, studio. So we did our best by designing in flexibility. So we designed a, a bracket. Uh, so all these projectors are mounted on flexible brackets and that can expand the facade to, to get a, a different angle of, of aiming onto the inside of the, um, the facets. And, and this was it at handover. So it's, this is like a drone capture um, showing how this, how this works, um, sort of twilight. And you can see again how the building, although it's, it's permeable metal, it, it looks like it's mirrors. Um, I mean, it's amazing how little light this sculpture needs to, to really stand out and gives this really extraordinary effect. And you can see as well that it, you know, it picks up the color of, of whatever the light is. So it sort of burns this really orange or, or champagne kind of a color. It's really quite impressive. So, um, here's a, a shot taken uh, on completion. And what was interesting about this photograph, I think, what was interesting about this photograph, I think, was, well, you can see that there's, there's lighting internally, you can see the structure internally. Um, there aren't flues there at the moment, they had to build the thing first, and then 
uh, when they started building, putting more turbines in, then they, they would populate it with more, with more flutes. So it's going to evolve over time. It's going to change. Um, but, but such is the, the kind of thing of art. But what is interesting, I think, from our point of view, was we, we really couldn't predict how much light this would pick up. So you can see the, the kind of uh, where the facets are facing downwards. They're picking up the sodium light, this kind of uh, light pollution from, from the sodium lanterns um, below. And, and I don't think I've ever seen sodium look so lovely. I mean, it really does flatter these, these uh, panels and this structure really well. And, and a little bit of it in context. As I said, it's on the A102. It's a really busy road. It's, uh, it's right next to the Blackwall Tunnel. And it is fighting with quite a lot of background kind of noise. But we feel that with the way that it's been handled and the way that we've kind of tried to approach the lighting, uh, we feel that we've taken something that has quite a negative kind of image environmentally, you know, with this idea that it's billowing smoke and pollution into the atmosphere. So it's been redefined as an asset and it's been defined as a piece of artwork in this new borough, which is Greenwich. Thank you. Um, just down. Do I start? Okay. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for coming. My name is, is this all right? Sanjit Bara, um, Design Director of Design Plus Light. And I want to talk about um, our biological response to lighting and artificial lighting. It's a very hot topic at the moment. And the aim of my talk is to give us a better understanding of how and why this happens before we start making decisions moving forward. The hormone of sleep which is melatonin, is most responsive to the blue end of the visual spectrum. Blue light activates melatonin receptors that signal the pineal gland to stop producing melatonin, and that prolongs our wakefulness. It stops us from sleeping. But changes in our time clock are not only due to sleep. People are beginning to think that it also influences all the other clocks that regulate the functions of the organs in our body. That is to say that things that influence our sleep clock, such as blue light exposure, have a far more serious implication to our health than thought before. Look at how we interact with daylight. Human beings with daylight. Human beings only perceive a very small proportion of what the sun sends out. And we call it the visible light spectrum. And we call it the visible light spectrum. We can only see everything between the ultraviolet and the infrared end of the spectrum. 
is a very dynamic composition of daylight is continually changing. And that depends on the time of day, the location on this earth, and also seasonal variation. And it's this 24-hour daily cyclical change in daylight that we have become most adapted to. In the mornings, as the sun rises, there is a very high portion of blue light in the atmosphere. This quickly signals our bodies to stop producing melatonin, and we become awake. Blue light peaks at around midday, and then starts to fall as the sun begins to descend. At sunset, there is very little blue light in the visual spectrum. This signals melatonin production, and our bodies are signaled to rest. It's absolutely brilliant. It's precision. We have evolved so that our hormonal time clock is precisely aligned with the spectral composition of daylight. Melatonin levels fall as daylight rises, and vice versa. Everything was going swimmingly until we decided to invent. In the 1990s, the invention of the blue LED light source revolutionized our industry with some potential unknown health consequences. White light is actually formed with the foundations of the blue LED chip, which then has a red phosphor coating on it, and the thickness of this red phosphor coating is what determines the color temperature of white light. So lighting now is a manufactured source. And LED light now, white light, has an underlying blue component, and this blue component is what's causing problems. And if we look at the comparative compositions of artificial lighting, our more traditional light sources, which were tungsten, incandescent lights, uh, the light is produced, produced by heating a wire filament in a gla gla glass gas-filled chamber. So the radiating heat and light is very high in the red end of the spectrum, with very little blue component. So traditional tungsten halogen light sources have much of an impact on our circadian rhythms. But with the advent of LED technology, this relative blue spike is present all the time, and this is what is causing interference. So let's analyze and understand this blue component a little better. There exists a paradox with blue light. On the one hand, we need it to regulate our circadian rhythms. But at the very periphery of our visual spectrum, at the blue-violet end of the spectrum, there exists a hazardous wavelength. This light is harmful to us. It causes damage to the back of our retina that is similar to UV damage um, created by prolonged sun. And this is what we begin, we're beginning to think contributes to the reduced visual acuity as you get older. Now, with daylight, this isn't that much of a problem because the preponderance of this spectrum of daylight is there for a very short duration at the, at the beginning of the day. But if we consider that we live and work in artificial environments that are artificially lit, and now this artificial lighting has a high blue-rich component, we don't know what the implications are, because LED lighting has only been around for 10 years or less. And it's cumulative and it's slow. So we are probably the generation that are going to experience any potential long-term damage. On the other end of the blue component, scientists have begun to discover a whole new set of receptors that are particularly attuned to the more blue-turquoise end of the spectrum. And these receptors signal the pineal gland to start producing melatonin. Hence, they're called melanopsin receptors. And they're the, the ones that regulate all of our circadian clocks. So not just sleep, hormone regulation, meta metabolic um, control, blood pressure, etc. When we are exposed to, to a lot of our chronic, and it's thought to be partly blamed to our chronic ailments at the moment. So things like cardiac disease, 
obesity, type 2 diabetes, um, and even potentially cancer, it's now thought that this is a contributing factor. We just don't know enough. But further investigating into these melanopsin receptors, we're finding that they're actually not evenly distributed around the retina. And this starts bringing into a spatial distribution quality to lighting. Research has now found that the melanopsin receptors are predominantly located at the lower perimeter of the eye, which means that they're most responsive to light coming above the horizon. That means that we have evolved so that our melanopsin receptors are particularly positioned so that we are most responsive to daylight above the horizon as we go about our natural business. Which means in artificial environments, where the majority of our lighting is overhead, our melanopsin receptors are continually being stimulated. So if we, interestingly enough, they're finding that if you get illumination from below the horizon, irrespective of what the composition of the light is, it has a very negligible effect on these melanopsin receptors. And that's a really interesting bit of information. So with all of this, what can we do? How do we put this all together so that we can start building environments that are a little bit healthier for us? How can we begin to make sure that we are in rhythm? Considering that we spend about 80 to 90% of our wakeful moments under artificial lighting, there is an opportunity now to use lighting design to bring us back into sync. Taking a little walk out in nature during lunchtime is not going to fix the problem. We have to now harness LED lighting to enable us to be in a 24-hour sink. <clears throat> if we look at the first, the first guideline or suggestion, is the quality of light. So if we begin to alter the color temperature in spaces that we predominantly spend the most amount of time in when we're awake, which is going to be offices, hospitals, schools, and other sort of health and fitness areas. Cooler color temperatures during the day, that will activate our melatonin receptors, melanopsin receptors, and keep us awake. But conversely, as we move towards the end of the day, change this to a warmer light source, so that we begin to color tuning and warm dim light sources out at the moment that allow you to change the color temperature of your white light source. But these are quite costly. And color, thinking about where the light is coming from relative to the time of day. We, start looking at, we can start looking at static color temperatures. Instead of color tuning, think about color temperatures that are optimized for our biological time of day or night. So during the day, have it cooler, which is what we do anyway. But in the afternoons, switch to a warmer color temperature, which doesn't activate the receptor we are led to believe that 3,500K or warmer is sufficient to allow us to get back into sync. Use that with, with intelligent controls and a more creative location of your lighting, and we can start becoming in balance. So there's a couple of guidelines that we can use. Um, during the day, a rule of thumb that we can say is light up the sky. And this is something we do inherently at the moment, which is have bright light levels, have melanopic rich light, which is a cool, bluer rich light source, and a high vertical lux, so overhead lighting. But this is something that we need to now incorporate in our, in our design of these spaces, and that's during the afternoon, darken the sky and light the fire which means lower the lux levels. There is a real push to have bright, bright, bright light levels, you know, more and more lumens. Why? Bring the light levels down. Have mel melanopic depleted light, so warmer light sources with less of the blue spectrum. And bring the light on the horizontal surface. You know, if we get illumination from table, irrespective of what the composition is, it's not going to activate our receptors as much. We are in a position where we are now, man, Man is now daylight levels of illumination continually. We have taken humanity out of the evolutionary, guide, uh, evolutionary borders of 
solar lighting into a new realm of our city, into a more natural rhythm. Thank you. Okay, um, <laughs> I think they're fine. I think they're fine. I should have like um, on stems or something. Oops. I am mic'd. Oh, you can hear me. Do I need to move it away? Testing, testing. Okay, that's good. Yep. So yep. That's fine. Any films will come up. Yeah. Hello. Uh, hello, I'm Marcy Song, uh, one of the directors at Seam Design, uh, based in Shoreditch, uh, in the heart of Creative London, uh, working globally. We are proud to be the official lighting partner for the London Design Festival again this year. Um, this is the, um, the 16th installment of the London Design Festival, and over these years, it has turned into, you know, has turned London into the global stage for the best design, and typically the first place that people go to for the best projects and for information. Landmark Projects has now taken over other sites across the city, and there are um, 11, 11 dis design districts that have opened up um, for the festival including the uh, West Kensington Design District, uh, Shoreditch Design Triangle, and uh, new to this year is the Regent Street and uh, the James uh, Street Design District. 
Um, so we've been involved in LDF um, for the past seven years, and our role on these projects have um, been, it, is to use light to tell or enhance these um, stories and interactions. As test beds, uh, these collaborations have challenged our creative thinking on a larger and more, on a larger and more uh, global portfolio. So let me take you through um, some of these projects. Um, Amanda Levitt's Timber Wave became the iconic gateway to the festival in 2011. Um, careful positioning of, you could see any spotlights, uh, we were able to knit together the arch with the um, historic facade of the V&A through projected um, patterns of shadow and light, which gave it an even bigger presence at night. For Endless Stare at the Tate Modern, we programmed grazers and spotlights by lumen pulse, there's and spotlights by lumen pulse uh, to move volumes of light around the piece um, to accentuate the voids and spaces that visitors are able to enjoy at nighttime. Barbara Oscarby, visitors are able to enjoy at nighttime. Barbara Oscarby gave us a very big challenge to, gave us a very big challenge to light their ambitious installation um, of kinetic mirrored wings. Um, so we chose uh, precise framing projectors by ETC, uh, with within an environment uh, carefully illuminated, the mirrored wings looked as though they were truly floating. Some lighting um, offered their art spotlights that could be retrofitted into the existing track uh, to um, properly graze the textured surfaces of concrete relief without adding spill to the tapestries. Candela consisted a programmable UV light bar with a precise cutoff to avoid any kind of UV um, light spill onto the um, delicate tapestries. And digitizing the light bar created um, beautiful dynamic patterns onto a, ro um, a rotating luminescent or lum photoluminescent surface. And here we have Alex Chenick's bullet from a shooting star for 2015, which is still standing at Greenwich Peninsula. Um, it is programmed with um, color changing floodlights and light sequences. On the smile by Allison Brooks, we used MCI Grupo's slender LED profiles, uh, which highlighted the warmth of the uh, timber interior and created um, a lantern through the perforations. Uh, the forest for um, Azif Khan, uh, we, we lit these by using a very simple system of Igutsini grazers and uplights. We were able to create um, numerous effects by illuminating the, car the polycarbonate walls and um, the ceilings with the cutoff that, um, that worked with the ceiling coffer layout. We also highlighted the beautiful greenery provided by conservatory archives um, and projected foliage patterns onto the soffits. For transmission by Ross Lovegrove, we used um, TM spotlights again. The kind of quick change optical lenses and warming filters helped us to graze the front edges of the loop single sculptural piece. So projects like these would not be possible without forward thinking um, sponsors who are huge um, supporters of innovative creators and makers uh, featuring the best in design. And we've had wonderful lighting partners um, in the past who have taken these journeys with us. Uh, who were when, where we are able to show what what light can bring to public art and how to demonstrate um, how to demonstrate how good lighting design um, is beneficial is a beneficial participant in the global art scene and how light brings value to design and to art and to the architectural experience. With each land, a landmark project and each art piece, there are many stories and narratives um, to tell and experiences to shape through the materiality of light. Um, to engage the public, whether it's tying together a sculpture to the site, or to challenge our perception um, of lighting design. Do we illuminate the art piece, or do we illuminate the experience? And how do we use our creativity and problem-solving experience? And how do we use our creativity and problem-solving skills uh, to achieve that perfect balance between poetic projects are typically fast um, and commence around May ahead of the festival. We'll have about two or three weeks to understand the proper or three to four weeks to develop a concept in alignment with the um, artist or architect's vision. And we'll spend another four weeks or so um, for design development to finish locations and quantities. Um, suppliers of the equipment, which are typically through sponsorship. And we'll run mock-ups um, and other lighting tests to finalize the detail and supply. And then um, August is taken up by, with the delivery team, uh, finalizing the lighting installations and programming the lighting until the festival opens. As a company ethos, we treat each project as a chance to innovate. Um, as a testbed, our work with the festival 
inspires us to, um, you know, to work on a larger scale projects, whether it's developing new ways of conceptualizing, researching, design thinking, um, and realizing the lighting schemes on experimental and experiential design. It, it's kind of like our annual, you know, our annual ex extreme sport in, uh, in design is a perfect place to work through extremes. So I'll briefly talk about the pylon and how it relates to one of our um, large schemes, which is the Mahanakan Tower in Bangkok by Bira Ola Shirin. Our lighting test on the pylon helped us to develop um, on a larger scale uh, the, um, a larger complexity of the facade lighting. We started the project out in about 2013, which involved um, retail components in the podium and in the cube, and lifestyle projects with David Collins Studio, like Vogue Lounge, um, and also the uh, Ritz Carlton Residence amenity floors. So all that remains to complete is the facade lighting and exterior landscape and plaza lighting. Um, so what's interesting about these two projects is that regardless of um, size, they required um, analysis on an urban scale. Um, with the pillar standing at 30 meters tall, we looked at visibility from flight path, uh, from you know, views from far distances and in close proximity. And this would inform us how and when, um, in terms of visual exposure and nighttime hours of appreciation, we should light the pylon. Um, Mahanakan Tower, standing at 314 meters in height, which is taller than the Shard in London, urban studies have helped us to understand how this will be viewed and experienced along dynamic paths, such as the BTS elevated rail and vehicular traffic, or on static scenarios from other towers and rooftops where people are able to view from a distance. We're able to test drive the system at low risk um, on the pylon before deploying onto the tower. Conceptually, we looked at Nikola Tesla electrics and colors of molten steel. It was raining a lot that year, so well, why not start the sequence with a lightning strike? Oops. Okay. Um, the, pylon had, the pylon itself had seven units to control. On the Hanakon Tower, we had over 630 units comprised of over 2,000 addressable, um, addressable units. And we had to do this using, and we could do this using the same line of control system um, in principle. In cities and urban environments, it is, it's usually commercial and civic buildings that are illuminated at night. Residential towers rarely get lit for obvious reasons like light spill, light ingress. Um, so Mahanakon Tower was a chance to do something iconic for the city. It was also a chance for us to be a part um, of the new Bangkok skyline. For LDF projects, um, they have short delivery schedules and short lifespans. On our larger projects, particularly those with high cost, there's a lot of um, pressure to get the design right and to future-proof so that we're not proposing a design that's a flash in the pan or to propose technology that will become obsolete. So Principal Tower, which is a little closer to home, and, and actually it's, it's literally across the street from the dark room, um, having worked on a number of um, commercial developments and towers globally, it's not often that we have the opportunity to create nighttime impressions of a building, especially an iconic tower in our own backyard. This tower, similar to the one in Bangkok, is primarily residential, so our investigations led us to propose a simple design that had dynamic capability. We worked closely with partner, um, uh, Foster and Partners to integrate our lighting into their facade fins, concealing luminaires from um, the street level looking upwards and from within the building looking out. And Vexica helped us to develop a new product for a, um, a continuous, uh, lighting, um, continuous lighting and also dynamic play. Uh, at each floor, the continuous linear bands of indirect lighting are addressed at 150 millimeter increments for individual control to create patterns and also uh, control together to create a continuous wash of light. Starting with a simple and an elegant scheme, we, looked, we took the individual bands to create a gradient uh, from the street level and running this up to the crown of the building. And at sunset, um, the facade lighting is uniform so that it can is set off of the color of the sky and it gradually moves upward um, to the crown of the building while residents come home at night. So on Principal Tower, we, we understood that um, a single detail can give optimal effect. Um, which brings us to this year's landmark project, uh, Multiply, uh, designed by Walt Thistleton, architects at Arab at the Sacklet Courtyard at the V&A. So lighting public art requires carefully looking at how visitors 
will see and interact with the art installation. We studied the behavior patterns such as where are the primary and secondary routes, uh, where are the decision-making points, how could lighting play an integral part of that narrative and that experience. We thought about, we thought about how many, I mean, many ways of, you know, how to, how to incorporate light and dynamism by uh, lighting various surfaces or 3D projection mapping, but the, the pavilion is already complex and engaging, so projections would reduce the visitor to an observer role and not an active participant. So we took a step back um, and we explored how we could achieve an elegant lighting concept aligned with the architect's approach uh, by exploring how lighting systems can translate into modular prefabrication techniques and assembly without taking away from the overall um, architectural and spatial design. So after looking at various services and practicalities of CNC milling and integration, we focus on the openings as um, framing devices that could provide interior and exterior lighting. This single detail could be in easily integrated into the modular fabrication process and populate the entire pavilion. The dynamic play comes through the activities and movement of people passing in front of the light source. Um, located at just the thresholds only. The pavilion touches the ground at seven modules, and we found out that we only had one power feed in the middle of the courtyard. Uh, so necessary exposed cabling was part of the design, and, carefully, um, and it carefully followed the corners, the undersides of the stairs, and the net barriers, seamlessly blending the, um, the cabling and the infrastructure into the pavilion. And as part of the test bed, we also, of this test bed, we also decided to use Bluetooth uh, modules and controls to reduce the amount of cabling required to create dynamic lighting. And um, here are some shots of the test build in York. And, um, and the seven, within three days, the last module was lifted into site. So for multiply, the complexity of light is woven into the architecture, adding to the pavilion's um, enjoyable experience. And I hope that you have an opportunity to check it out before um, it closes on the 1st of October. So through these LDF projects, we acknowledge how lighting of a tower or an immersive um, or an interior experience is like lighting an art piece or an immersive environment. Each project has a different and unique stories to tell, and we do our best to weave that um, narrative and is how lighting engages the public, gathers people together, and particularly in places like London, which is becoming so culturally rich at night. Thank you. So they're doing a special opening, or they're keeping it open specially for us. Well, I say specially for us. Especially for you. Yes, especially for me. So <laughs> anyway, for I'm, I'm glad.
<laughs> oh, so I have to do the buttons as well. Right, okay, hello. Welcome. So, for the love of cables, <laughs> why in such an age of technology am I banging on about cables? Why, it seems ridiculous, this like, we're making a new technology, and in my personal opinion, it's not working. There's so many elements to it that I just feel you're getting it wrong, and you need to really like step back and take a look at it. I'm not an expert in this technology field. I'm a designer, and I'm the person at the end of the chain. I'm the person using this stuff, I'm the person implementing it on projects, and I'm the person who wants it to succeed. But there's so many points where I'm just like so frustrated every time. So, I decided to talk about this word, connectivity which was like the number one word for clean. And so many people are talking to me about the, the uh, build-up of this connectivity. Oh, it's going to change everything. You're going to be so happy. It's going to be amazing. And I was just like, kind of, I just looked at this jargon. It's like, you're going to have to do something really new at this show to really impress me, because at the moment, like, this technology is going nowhere. So... I have some stories before this and the way that it kind of built up. And one of them is um, my friend, Joe, he's really obsessed with this technology. He's got Alexa and Siri linked up to his Hue, his Sonos, loads of stuff in his office. And it's, I went around, I was like, oh, you know, we're chilling out after work. And he's like, hey, Alexa, turn the lights on, please. Nothing. Hey, Alexa, turn the lights on, please. Nothing. He's like, fuck, this is ridiculous. Hey, Siri. Turn the lights on, please. And still nothing. And then the third, fourth time of him asking Siri, he just managed to scrabble around his desk and find a light switch and turned it on. And I just think this is just like, I was just sitting there laughing in the darkness until he managed to turn the lights on. It's just like, why this interaction and this connectivity between things is so poor. So, this is the kind of other background things that you kind of research, you show at the presentations. And I took all the company names out so they could live stream it. How many servers could it take to turn on a light bulb? And this guy saying, hold my beer. So this is a major reputable communication, internet of things, light bulb. And does it really need to be this complicated? And, I'm, and we're working on a project at the moment uh, where we've, we're actually employing someone to make us an internet of things device. And it's really, really complicated. And um, it can be this complicated. I'm happy with that. I'm happy for the experts to do this. But for me as the end user, you've got to start making things more simple and make things better. And we'll get to that. So... This is how I got to talk here. I emailed Martin and Sharon a very cryptic message saying, I am the cable Illuminati department, and I will hijack your transmission and propaganda based on, uh, based on connectivity. All praise the cable. And I managed to get in with such a funny picture as well. Um, this all was the build-up to Light and Build 2018. I didn't put this on my, like, uh, Outward Networks, this is only on Facebook. I kind of had a massive rant about cables online and said, look, I'm going to this trade show, but I've made this design of a t-shirt. I was just going to get one made and wear it as a bit of a like, micro-protest. And um, like 30 of my friends all wanted them. So I got a massive print run done. <laughs> and this is the design. And it's the Illuminati triangle. The eye is slightly pointed up to stare at you when you're talking to someone. And it's cable cross-sections all over, and it has the holy trinity of live, neutral, and earth in the corners. And it's better to stare at you and tell you, maybe you're like, you know, not thinking right. Maybe you should see a different view in this kind of things. So yeah, it's like, come on, kick out the jams. If you know about the Illuminati, you know about the jams. And yeah, let's make something new. So this is the, this, even this dude who is printing it found this whole concept. He's a printer like, in Southport, near Bournemouth, hand screen printing. And he was like, yeah, my dad wanted to throw his Alexa out the window. <laughs> it's, like, it's brilliant. And yeah, I got this whole run, posted them out, and yeah, loads of people really liked it. Now, there's one thing, that just before I went to Frankfurt, I had a really stressed time, and I, went to the, I got, managed to work at the mecca of cables, if there could be such a place. In Cornwall, there's a little town called Pufkerna, which is extremely famous in cable history. It's where the first Atlantic cable come off, uh, the Atlantic, and where all the communication before the war, 100 years, were done by a tele telegraph cable. And I got to work there, and they have, this is me, with my hard hat, with the cable Illuminati. And they have all sorts of cable uh, stuff, you know, it's awesome. It's a huge history of how cables work, what they're doing. This place was so um, desired to hit during the war that it was, you know, they put flamethrowers all along the beach to protect this one spot where all the cables and the communication were going from England to the rest of the world, to America, down to Cape Town. It, it was incredible. The little bits around this are just made fun. I've just designed this cables t-shirt and I've just turned up in a town where there's old cable lane. It was, was for sale at this point. So I was texting my friends, come on, let's buy this pub. Let's make a cable pub. 
Yeah, it'd be awesome. This is me in an, as usual, precarious health and safety moment, fixing some cables in the museum. And this is it kind of working. Again, cables, DMX, woo, everybody. Uh, we could talk about how problematic that could be in another talk. <laughs> it did actually, in such a messy format, it did actually make something quite nice. And it's a bomb map of West Cornwall, West Penwith, if you want to be specific about your Cornish stuff. I'd probably even say Porth Curdo wrong, but the Cornwall fanatics can come and talk to me afterwards. So you can see that the Germans really tried to bomb this area. That the Germans really tried to bomb this area, and they were trying to hit the cable, so they stop the communication. And yeah, this is quite fun. And you kind of like uh, nice. This was with a project working with Abe Rogers Design, which was good. And this is me in front of some cables with my cables T-shirt that I just got printed. That I was quite proud of. And some guys that put the cables under the sea for us many years ago and started the communication. And uh, just along the coast from here is where Marconi did the first transatlantic wireless communication. It took, you know, like 100 years after they started the war, and it says, like, only 3% of the world's... There we go. And this is the kind of place, the kind of maps and propaganda. It's such a cool museum if you ever get a chance to go. So, cables. Right, so there we go. We're on to light and build now. Or, as our work WhatsApp group calls it, light and bewilderment which is probably full-fitting. It was their first time, and they definitely found it rewarding. Now, I designed this T-shirt for a number of reasons. One is the... Well, not the number. One reason, conversations. As I said, I'm not an expert. I'm only bothered about how things work and how I'm interacting with it and something I can sell on to people. I don't want to, I don't know, I want to know about the network address and the STMP server or the... You know, it's, I want how it works, and I want to talk about that bit, and that's the bit that I think is important. So this is my colleague wearing her cables T-shirt, and we had walked around and had fun and just had some conversations about it. And we, we, this is a kind of like brief overhaul of when I did, why they're like, why is this T-shirt? Like twenty percent were kind of not even considered that this connectivity thing was just this buzzword, and they weren't even bothered about it. They weren't like, well, I'm here for the lights. I'm not really bothered about this thing. Forty percent agreed that it was difficult to use or there was problematic or issues were coming up, but they didn't really care. They were like, oh, the technology will sort itself out. And 35% were slightly bothered, but, you know, they're not going to do anything about it. And then there were 5% of people, and I'm sure some of them are going to talk to me afterwards. And they were the diehard, really, were like, you are an idiot. Why are you questioning this new technology? It's amazing. And I guess for them, it's, it's kind of like Microsoft before we had Apples. Everything would work perfectly with Microsoft. But then when everyone got Apple, it's like, well, it works so much nicer, so I use this. Um, and this is true. One of these devices, which remain num numbless, I managed to get into, I've, read, I've tried to come up with a lighting company name that would make it feel safe. Like, so let's say this is Home Light. I logged in on the app and then I was turning that. As anyone that goes to Light and Build, you should seriously consider going to Hall 8 if you're into cables because people are selling cable trays and stuff to do with cables, even rolls to do with cables. And if anyone's got this deep into Light and Build, it is totally bewildering. I, so much so, I got completely lost. And thank God for this Spanish guy. It totally saved me. I literally walked up to him. Big hangover, we're going in about an hour, and I was lost. He directed me out, so that was nice. So, I hope you get the Matrix joke on this one, but how deep does the go? We have the journey that I went on to talk about cables and learn stuff, so surely I should present something to you about learning. So this is me with a lot of cables and the kind of funny things. And after a summer of people shouting cables at me and coming up to me, and I know, all sorts of different conversations about this, it's been quite a fun thing. So yeah, so what? So what? This is me, the sheep, and this is me with the cable. Should I have the cable or should I have the wireless approach? Yeah? This is why I want to start a happen. If we're going to do this wireless technology, we're going to do it right. We want an open conversation. People need to listen about what the end people want and what you know, we want to do with these things. At the moment, it's always someone comes to you, oh, look, check out this app. Yeah, you can add a room. Yeah, oh, great, it's for an art gallery. It's so many things to just start to bring into conversation, talk about how things. Open lifetime. So many of these things are just locked in to one lifetime, like the, uh, like the life cycle of your phone, three to five years. So much technology is going this way where it's just really, I just, it's not good for the environment, it's not good for the world. We need to kind of start thinking about things that can work in the long term. And open source. It's very important. You need to keep these things open so anyone can use them and they can develop their own uh, ways to communicate. So if I wanted to build a you know, co uh, control system for it, that I could look to do that. I could communicate with different things, control three or four different types of this kind of connectivity over one system, and then other people could do that. Obviously, I'm a small designer working for a small design design company, but sometimes I do build these kind of systems, and that's when I kind of want that flexibility that things are going to work and interchange with each other. Open knowledge. is talk to each other about the knowledge we're gaining and make something happen with it. 
and open connectivity. All these kind of points are like the good things that cables do, and that's what I want to bring to the wireless kind of world. We need to kind of like make things connect with each other easily and for a good way for the end user. And the final one, remind me later, instead of an update, I want a stop date. No more updates. If you release a product, give it me that. That's it. I don't mind buying the new one in three years, but it's also maybe for some stuff, not for stuff I'm going to put in someone's ceiling. But stop date. Yeah, so here we go, me at Cables and Animals. Um, I made a bit of a website, and if you're interested in buying, getting a t-shirt because you feel strongly about cables, or you just think it's an amusing topic, this is what the website says. And this kind of represents how I feel about the connectivity market with lighting really presenting themselves. There is no information, only overheard hearsay and opinion. The information has been lost by a, the interference of a thousand useless local wireless signals. The real intention has been lost since the last update. There is no information as the source code is closed. And the marketing department have changed their URL, the Cable Illumini, the Cable Illumini department. It's kind of how I feel at the end. You try and get any information out of these people, no chance. You want to change something? Pfft. My friend said this. He's a server technician. He was a server technician for National Theatre, and now he's doing major banks. And he, he loved this T-shirt. He's like, this is my, you know, he's dealing with a lot of cables. A lot, lots, two more cables than I've... All data runs through cables. It's the glue of humanity. And I think that's just such a profound statement. We need to like really understand that our interconnected lives can get a lot better and can be a lot more full on. We can be connected to loads of different stuff. There's a lot of interesting being used when you walk around upstairs. You, you, your phone vibrates when you walk past people. Maybe that's fun. It's wireless, but it seems to work because it's been annoying me. But so, yeah, it's going through cables before it vibrates me, so that's fine. And yeah, for the love of cables, that's. My talk. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, open conversation. <laughs>
Right, my name is Marcus. I run MS Lighting Design, and today I am going to talk about project management. Now, we specialize mainly in residential projects, but hopefully this can be transferred onto residential, uh, onto commercial projects and other situations. So, why am I talking about project management? Lighting designers, sort of, we, don't, we don't do this sort of stuff. It's sort of, why do we want to do it? Well, we're lighting designers, and what we want to do is create beautiful environments. We want to have... Uh, gorgeous spaces, people go in and they have an experience. They feel comfortable, they're excited by these spaces that they're going into. And lighting is an intrinsic part of this. So we want to make that happen. But part of the key reasons for this uh, is you need to actually create this space. But as I said, we're designers. Why do we need to do this? We produce the design, give it over, other people implement this. We're not contractors, we don't build this sort of stuff. Um, they should follow all the documents we produce and they should know how to do this. But when you think about it, these projects are a reflection of your work. We are lighting designers, we're creative people, we love to create beautiful spaces. Lighting designers, we're creative people, we love to create beautiful spaces and we're associated with you and that's not good for your reputation. Um, poorly run projects, delayed projects, again, not going to really build confidence in your design skills and what you're doing. And as a relatively young design, because it is necessary, it's important for people to have good lighting design. So it makes a real difference to their lives. Okay? If we're there during the project management phase, it's going to be easier to get a good finish. And at the end of the day, if we don't have nicely finished projects, there's going to be less chance of doing future projects, which we all want to be able to do. Okay, so what we have to do is have this balance between no control and just saying, here you go, here's the package, get on with it, and having total control where we go and hire all the contractors and we run them, we tell them every minute detail which they have to do on the project. So we have to find the balance between these two because we don't want to be running contractors, but we need to help them out a little bit. So the first step starts before you've even done the design. Okay, what you need to do is talk to your client and get a proper brief from them. Find out what they want to achieve. What are their goals? What are their desires for this project? And sometimes clients don't even know what they want. Okay, we need to go there and we need to talk to them. We need to make them think about what they're trying to achieve with this project. What are the critical elements? Is it time? Does it have to be finished by a very tight deadline? Is it budget? Is it very low budget? How is that going to affect it? And we need to discover this to find out why they're doing this project. Right? Once we've found out why they're doing it, we can guide them to the best solution. We can come up with a lighting design. Choices, and they are educated about what we're trying to do. They understand why we're doing it, why we're making those choices, and they get to say, yes, I want to go ahead with this. Okay? And if you can get their buy-in, this is really important for later on. The reason this is important is because if your client believes in what you're doing, okay, they'll protect your design. We do the lighting design very early on in a project, and then the project gets going, and suddenly, budget gets start, being start spending it everywhere, except where you're going to spend it on the lighting, which comes later on, when they're going to what we've done on the lighting design. We don't want them making changes. Someone's going to come in there, and they're going to be like, oh, we just want to tweak this. We want this fitting in because it's cheaper. But if your client believes in what you've done, they'll understand the reason, the final result. Okay? So you've got to get the client to believe in what you're doing because they're going to help you protect it at the end of the day. Then you need to get the as well. Okay? Career. You need to bring all these people together. You need to talk to the architect, the interior designer, project management. You need to understand what's going on in that project, what they want, and work with them and evolve that design. Okay? Because they also have to understand what you want. We can't do lighting design on our own. We have to have these other roles there to support us and create the structure and build everything for our light board. And we work in this collaborative way to really create a project which is going to function at the end. And then finally, you need to support the contractor. Now, often, the contractor gets left until last. They are left to get on with it. They have a lot of other pressures. But what you need to do is understand what motivates that contractor. Why are they They're doing it? Because they want jobs, they want to build. But actually, a lot of contractors love what they do. They love creating spaces. 
but they often find themselves a bit lost. They don't really, okay? You want to help them out. And then, when it comes to any problems, they're going to give you a call. They're going to check things with you. They're going to make sure, is this the right way of doing it? They're less likely to go in there and try and substitute different products in or try and change what you've created. They're going to actually work to build your lighting design. Because we're not building it, they're building it. So we need to support them to be able to build it. And this will hopefully will lead to a successful project. So next, what we need to do is tackle some key problem areas. Now this, for me, is something that comes up time and again on different projects which I see. And I work really hard to make sure that we tackle this as early on as possible. So the first is control gear specification, then control gear location, and finally lighting controls. And these are often tr problem areas which can cause delays later on. So first is control gear specification. If you don't get the right control gear, it's not going to function properly. And while it leave up to contractors, you leave it up to lighting suppliers, I think as lighting designers, we should be a lot more involved in this. We should know what control gear is going in there. Does it actually function the way we want it to function? Because if they get that wrong, then the lighting is not going to work properly. And people won't look at it and go, oh, they've got the wrong control gear. They'll look at it and say, oh, that's a bad lighting design. Okay? You get the blame. It's not going to reflect on anyone else. They just see bad lighting. Okay? People don't see good lighting. They see beautiful spaces, but they will see bad lighting. Okay? So I think it's really important to get involved in this. One of the key areas is dimming and making things dimmable. Just seeing something as dimmable is not okay. okay. As we all know, there are many different types of dimming. They require different wiring. We need to actually find out what that is for a product, make sure it's specified correctly, check, especially with decorative fittings, are they dimmable? How are they going to work? We can't assume that things are going to dim. We can't assume they're going to function on your standard twin and earth cable. There needs to be extras want run in there. And so we need to make sure this is happening early on. We need to help specify this control gear to make sure that it's right within the project. So if we don't do this early on, it's not going to get done later on. It's going to cause huge problems. Okay? You need to check the manufacturer's specifications. Are there limits in distances? Because if you're going to put a fitting in the center of the room and you need to have remote control gear, how far away is that control gear going to go? If the contractor doesn't plan for this early enough, then it might end up 20, 30, 40 meters away. You get volt drops going to work within there. Number of drivers, if they don't run the right number of cables out. So you might have a very high output LED strip, but you need three or four drivers to run for the complete room, but the contractor gets one cable there. Because he didn't know. He's only going to know when it gets to second fix and those drivers turn up and he's like, oh, uh-oh, I haven't got the right cables here. I haven't run enough. And then your lighting won't function. So it's really important to get involved in this because this is what's going to make the lighting work. Next, we have control gear location. So all of this control gear, all these accessories need to be hidden somewhere. And when you hide them away, they need to be accessible. Now, when you go through the design process and start construction, often lighting and the electrical design runs in parallel to joinery design. And you want to hide a lot of this control gear in the joinery in that property. Okay? But often it's not discussed with the joinery company how you're going to access this, how you're going to maintain it, how it's going to be wired in, how much space has been allowed for it. Now, it's really important to do this because otherwise if it's left to when the electrical contractor is on site, what you'll have is you will have this delay you will have to go back to the joiner who maybe has completed shop drawings and tell them, actually, we need to rework all of this because it turns out we've got to hide 20 drivers' drawings, get it all okayed by the design team, how they're going to do this, this process. might take three or four weeks. And then suddenly, you've shaved three or four weeks off your finished schedule. It's not going to work. That joinery might take 12 weeks to produce, and they're going to want to deliver that right at the end. If you're going to push it back three or four weeks, that's affecting the finish date of the project. So if you plan for this early on, and you know what's going to be going in there, then what you can do is you can make sure this is allowed for in the joinery. That can all be taken into account in the design. So this is why it's important, because it will affect the project. And if you're going to cause huge delays, 
then there are either going to be compromises made on the lighting, or the project's going to be delayed, and that's going to reflect badly on you. Finally, there's lighting controls. So often, lighting controls are left up to AV suppliers for projects, and they might not understand about what you want to achieve with lighting. When you're using a lighting control system, you're going to use scenes. Uh, you want to create that atmosphere, that mood, that wow moment when a client walks in and they press one button and suddenly they're blown away by how the space looks. And the lighting is intrinsic to that. Now, if you don't work with the control system company, you might end up with a switch on the wall which has got 20 buttons. And what's the client going to press? They don't know what they're going to do. They're confused. So they're going to be upset. They don't know how to use their lighting. They're scared to touch it. It's simple. We don't want a giant slider switch or anything on the wall. What we want is to simplify it. And so we have to get really involved in this and in the commissioning to make sure they set it up properly. Because they might not care about your lighting. They care about their AV system. Does the system work? Great. But you, you care about creating that experience for the client. Okay? Now we get on to my final tips. So the first one is contractors. You need to understand what motivates them. Why are they on this job? What do they want to achieve? They want to get the job done. They don't want to have to repeat their work again because they've made mistakes. No one likes ripping out stuff to do it all again. So you understand what motivates them and then use that to your advantage. Work with them. I like this quote from Abraham Lincoln, the best way to destroy an enemy is to make them a friend. Okay? Get that contractor on side. Okay? If you work with them, they're going to make sure it's all done correctly. Okay? Next, plan ahead. Make sure you can answer those contractors' questions ahead of time. You've got all the information there. You can point them to the right tools. They might not check their design package. Okay? You can only do so much, but if you brief them, if you make sure you're there available to answer their questions, then they will be willing to engage with you and make sure that you get a good outcome. Don't play the blame game. Often people just say, it's not my problem, I've done my design. Engage. Get involved. Okay? If, you, if a problem comes up, you shouldn't be thinking, oh no, you should be thinking, great. We can get this sorted. It can be a positive outcome. We can get it all sorted out for the client. And at the end of the day, the client is going to be happy because they see that you're there not to be paid. You're there because you care about the design. You care about getting it right. You haven't just had your paycheck and you're done and you're not involved anymore. You want to be involved. You want a good outcome. And this will lead to better projects and a better finish. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope that helps a little bit with running your projects.
for 18, 20 years now as a design consultancy. We've done a lot of projects. We're up to about project 750. We've done about 150 hotels. And we've encountered a lot of guidelines and a lot of regulations from a lot of different people and organizations. And almost all of them are crap, and you do not need them. <laughs> Firstly, they change all the time. This is a few ones I picked up. I like the bottom one in America. They used to recommend 140 lux for chalkboards, and now they recommend 1,400. I don't think we've evolved that much since the 30s. Fashion sense, maybe. Um, they change all the time. They are completely different. They, they randomly go up and down. Um, different countries have different ones. Different countries recommend different things. They can't all be right. I don't... Doing a bit of research on this, and I looked up Sibsi. This is the one organization. These are all from the Sibsi guideline. Supermarket, 750 lux. Hypermarket, 1,000 lux. That's the third more, and therefore a third more expensive, and a third more power, and a third more fittings, and a third more lux. And I don't think all the stuff they sell is really tiny in hypermarkets, and you need a lot of light more. Warehouse, you know it's not a big warehouse, 200 lux. DIY store looks pretty like a warehouse to me big shelves full of stuff, apparently you need five times as much light. At the back of the DIY store, certainly the one near my house, because I'm middle-aged, go warehouse. I did a bit of research into theory, no physical basis for any of them. Apparently they're all just made up by someone. Um, um, they tell you to do things which you wouldn't otherwise do. The picture on the left has the Sibsi recommended light level for a restaurant of 200 light your partner there immediately. It's the nicest place you can go in London for a little romantic drink. Um, if you do that and you take your light meter out in the middle of the wine bar, which I have to say I have done, um, you, end up with about, you end up with about five luck. You can conform to all guidelines and still end up with bad lighting. I don't know who did this project. I hope they're not here. If it's one of you, I'm sorry. Um, 300 lux on the desks, nice lit walls, ceilings are okay. Not a good lighting design. Um, this is a project we got involved in, and they asked us to redo it. And the next slide is what we changed it into, which is much nicer. Um, exactly the same place, pretty much the same viewpoint, I think. If you look at it, you can see the columns are the same. So, and the same kind of light levels, but it's not the light levels that make the lighting design. It's, it's the design, the whole integration with the architecture, the, the approach, the color temperature, everything else. They also almost always fail to mention what's actually important about lighting. Um, one of the first things we do as a, as a company when we get involved in lighting is work out what color temperature we're going to have. I've yet to see a guideline specify color temperature. We do a lot of hospitality work, so we tend to end up down the kind of 2,300. This looks much nicer on my screen than it does up here. Um, down the kind of really warm end of the color temperature sensor, so scale, sorry. Uh, 2,300, 2,005, I, it doesn't, guidelines don't ever tell you what to use or specify it. They, it's just left to someone. What I think is one of the most important things. I think it's more impact level. Equally, they don't tell you how much um, accenting you need and how much, what the kind of display illuminance ratio is. This picture on the left, again, same shot. Don't say none of which we ever have. If you look up the whole Middle East, they all have their own guidelines on lighting, and none of them have ever specified that you need a kind of really high display illuminance to work. Um, blue light makes you alert and awake, which we should all know by now because we all studied circadian rhythms and everything. But other other scientifically proven things that red lighting makes you more aggressive. There's references down at the bottom if you're interested. Uh, yellow lighting makes you full of the joys of spring and happy. I think it's got something to do with daffodils, but I'm not sure. Um, so, and this, again, these are all proven elements, much more proven and much more shown to be true than the light levels, which all the guidelines insist on you having. I, um, we've had a lot of projects where the client just wants, I just want the bare minimum to comply with the kind of SIBSI guidelines or with kind of brand standards. I want 300 lux uniformly across the floor. Um, Moves all the interesting bits. If you're doing a bar or something, you might put lighting in the shelves, you might put tunable white, you might put up lights in the floor. Um, they all get cut in favor of just a uniform lighting level that meets the kind of minimum guidelines. So they don't help, they don't achieve anything. Sometimes it causes over illumination, makes it too bright. Um, is it dark in the moonlight there? And kind of removing any kind of atmosphere or niceness as you go. And it encourages anyone with a copy of Dialux to think they AutoCAD can be an architect. It's not the same. So, 
regulations and guidelines, they are prone to change, they are arbitrary, they lack in any kind of evidence, they're often inaccurate, they're often irrelevant, and they omit all the important things of what actually makes a good lighting design. So it's time to get rid of them all. Time to get rid of them all. That's my next slide. <laughs> okay, a bit of an artistic revolution slide here. This is the Déjeuner sur le herbe, and I apologize for my French accent. Uh, it was by Manet, exhibited at the Salon des Refusés. In 1863 in Paris, very finely, nice watercolors and still lives and so on. Um, still very much the kind of Italian Renaissance style, the kind of Michelangelo school of art. And all the impressionists uh, had real trouble getting all them saying, no, we're not showing your stuff, it's not art, we don't know what it is. Um, so one year, everyone who's been refused to be impressionists and everything that came afterwards, the kind of pontilists, everything we know now know as kind of conceptual art started here and then. And it was basically because they refused to accept the guidelines and the... And the so, in the same way, we could just ignore them all. We could just ignore all the guidelines because they're made up, they're arbitrary, we don't really like them. Uh, we can read them, we can learn them, we can understand where they come from, and then we can discard them and throw them away. Uh, favorite quote of the day, Wittgenstein, famous philosopher, if you've ever done philosophy, um, done philosophy. Um, he wrote a book about how language was meaningless, and someone asked him how, how it could possibly be that language is meaningless, how could he understand his book if his book is meaningless? And he said, well, it's like a ladder, you climb up, after you've climbed up it, you throw it away. Same with guidelines, they're useful to read and learn, you can kind of know what they're about, and then you can ignore them happily. And if you do ignore them happily, you end up with some really nice lighting design. This is the stairs at Andas Hotel in Delhi. And it's main kind of ballroom entrance. It's got a very low light level on the, um, on the floor, well below CBC guidelines. Um, a bit like these stairs here, actually, because actually, I'm slightly tedious. Measured the light level on those stairs. There was an 11 lux. So <laughs> just before I came in. <laughs> um, so yeah, so once we're free of the restraints of having to do what, what all these people tell us, we can just end up with really nice lighting. This is the, uh, in the Caribbean. So again, there are large kind of dark areas on the floor. The table's lit quite well, but there are large chunks of darkness um, well below any kind of uniformity regulations or lighting guideline regulations. This is the, uh, this is also at St. Kitts. This is the one of the pools they have. They've got quite a lot of pools. This is lit not with a standard 500 lux uniformly from massive floodlights, but with a fiber optic uh, floor. It's a little star effect floor in there. Um, it's really nice. It's like swimming among the stars. It's really nice. I shouldn't have gone in really because it wasn't open when I was there. Um, <laughs> but I did because, you know, it's nice. Um, but yeah, lit well below all kind of standards and guidelines. Or, or this place, a complete willing disregard for any kind of uniformity criteria that people might want to imply. Um, but it transforms what could have been a very tedious corridor style space into quite a nice selection of little pools of light. Gives it a little bit of interest. This is a area, a Marriott project we did recently. Um, and it just lifts it slightly. It's also, I'd like to point out, quite a lot cheaper because you need quite a lot less downlights if you're not trying to fill the whole space with uniform lighting. You're just trying to create an interesting mood rather than a 300 lux solution. And I think that's it, really. I think I just wanted to say light is art. Go create and don't worry about what people tell you to do.
Thank you. Oh. Afternoon. Hello. And uh, hello to everybody streaming, wherever you are. I don't know where you, your camera is, but um, uh, welcome, yes. Over there. Oh, hello. Um, <laughs> so my, uh, my name is Mark. Um, I'm here today let me see if I can do this, to talk to you about a project uh, which is uh, our sunlight simulation experience. Um, so I'm not going to hold around too much doing too many introductions. I'm going to go straight into the project itself because there's a lot to talk about. So the project itself. So this is our office in Birmingham. Uh, we were pretty much bursting at the seams and uh, we, we pretty much used all the space uh, we could find to get people into the office. And uh, we just ran out of space. And so, but luckily for us, um, the tenants above uh, handed in their notice and the floor became vacant. So um, it was decided by management that we would take the floor above and we would uh, add some more office space, some more workspace, and also some breakout spaces, and we'd tart it up a little bit. We'd do bits to the town hall. And the key bit, we would put in a uh, new bespoke uh, staircase. And what this would do is it would join the two floors together. So this is the fifth floor we can see here. Uh, join the two floors together, both visually and physically, so people could see through, and everyone felt like they were part of this one big office environment. So... Um, like all our offices in Cundall, um, we tr try and use them as a bit of a test bed. So uh, we like to push uh, innovation and ideas uh, forward in our own offices first before for letting them out onto the general public. So um, like we've done in previous offices, uh, London here, uh, we were one of the first offices to uh, get a well accreditation, uh, I think in the UK, um, uh, awards for, uh, I think, we're four point something watts per square meter uh, for our office lighting. At the time, that was, that was quite a big thing. Um, so the office itself um, is going to be fairly straightforward. We were going to reuse some of the fittings that we had on the fourth floor and repurpose and recycle them and reuse them in different ways, trying to limit the space we need to do something a little bit special, a little bit different, and sort of showcase what we can do uh, with light and lighting. So what do we do? Um, all lighting designers want to show off, I think, and so we want to create something. So we thought, should we do something like a feature pend? And this is something we did in Broadgate Quarter, just, just around the corner. Do we create something bespoke, something uh, just for this staircase that sort of shouts, hello, look at me, I'm an amazing pendant. And we all thought, no, I'm not sure that's the right thing to do. The stair is quite a beautiful thing in itself. It, maybe it will detract from it. So we thought, well, do we start to integrate? Do we start to put something within the lattice of the stair? Do we work with it to create a feature? Uh, and again, it, it all became a bit too complicated. I don't know if you saw earlier, the, uh, the, the structure of the stair was a sort of lattice, very delicate um, um, architecture stair itself was going to be the feature in this space. And that any lighting we applied to it would have to um, be sympathetic to the stair itself. So we're scratching our heads, as we do, and one of, the, one of the girls in the team said, well, why don't we just cut a big hole in the roof? Let all the sunlight and the daylight come through, a bit like a Pantheon-style type of installation, you know, natural light coming through. And we went, yes, that's a great idea. Let's cut a great big hole in the roof. But I don't, the, the landlord wasn't too pleased, obviously, as you can imagine, and, uh, and also the budget, unfortunately, wouldn't stretch to, uh, to one hole, let alone two holes uh, in the slab. But at, on that point, it resonated with us, and we just couldn't stop thinking about the idea of this natural light coming from above, this sort of angelical kind of light coming down the staircase, even though it's right in the middle of the office where there's no daylight at all. And so we started to think about daylight and natural light, and we, and we sort of concluded that we could break it down into these three main components, uh, colour, intensity, there's a lot of talk about tunable white. It's coming more and more important and uh, more and more prevalent in the industry. Uh, but for you, people who don't know, um, this is about the idea of uh, warmer colour in the day and then back down to this sort of warmer colour temperature at night time. Now, it's becoming sort of uh, ingrained in, in what we're starting to do now as line designers. So that was kind of like the first thing. The second thing, which it was intensity, and this is a little bit less understood and this is to do with the idea that um, uh, people, are, people prefer uh, lower levels of light 
uh, when they have a warmer colour temperature. Obvious, really, and, and we all probably do this at home when you're working late, catching up on a few things uh, with your side lights on around in your, in your, in your living room. Um, that sort of warmer, lower level of light, we, we're quite happy. We're not, we don't expect a much brighter, more intense level of light. And then the third one then, movement. This is where I think it starts to get a bit more interesting. Uh, offices typically are very static. They're, they're, you know, they're very, um, in terms of lighting anyway, they're sort of uniform uh, blankets of light. Sometimes we, we localise lighting, which is, which is what we're always pushing for. But, but generally, movement as an idea in office wasn't, hasn't really been thought of too much. And the sun moves, and the sky moves, and the clouds move, and we move as people, and objects move through the spaces, and shadows change, and intensity of light changes. And that kind of... Um, uh, I suppose animation of light is, is what really fascinated us as a group. So we decided that these three things, these three simple components would be the basis of our design, the heart of our design. So we started to think, well, how do we introduce that? How are we going to put that into this installation? And uh, again, I don't know where this idea came from, but the idea of uh, a clock and the idea of a passing of time came into our mind. And so we thought, well, with that, you've got sort of these... Uh, 12 points on a clock. And we keep the installation quite simple, really. Uh, we would have individual luminaires uh, based at each point in time around the clock. And the light would come from above, and we'd get this really amazing sort of uh, angelical lighting feeling that we were after. And then what we'd start to do with that, we'd start to introduce these other three components, which would be the colour. So shifting of the colour in the morning. From, from, uh, from, from sort of 2,000, 2,500 Kelvin up to the 4,500. And we'd also then introduce this intensity, this idea that at the lower levels of light, when we're at the, the low level, we would have a much less uh, intense level of light. So we'd dim the lights down to, say, 50%. And we'd ramp them back up again in the day to say 100%. So we got this cooler lighter, cooler light, and more intense, uh, brighter level of light. And then finally, the movement. And this was a bit where it starts to get a bit more interesting. We'd start to move the direction of which the light came down onto the stairs by simply um, turning on and off or dimming the lights in this kind of clock sequence so that the lights would come from, say, 12 o'clock. Every hour, they would be shifting around where the light was physically. So montaged it onto the architect's renders to try and sell this idea to him and to the management board of, this is what we'd like to do. Are you okay with this? So sunrise, morning, so you can see the shadows moving across and the intensity of light and the also color of light changing. And the shadows were beautiful. The light from above was lovely. But we weren't getting this kind of uh, animations that we'd all kind of were... Thing was a bit slow. It was a bit too subtle. We'd almost made something too natural that we didn't really notice anything was happening at all. And it's taken us back to where I started with and the idea that as lighting designers we want to do something and sort of show off and say, hello, look, this is what we've done. And so um, we scratched our head a little bit more. We stood around and we thought. And we decided that what, what, what would happen if we sped up the 12 hour cycle and condensed it into two minutes? How would that feel? What would that be like? And there was obviously a lot of um, questions about that came around about that because uh, this is a stair. You know, people do walk up and down this stair. Uh, you know, to get from four to five. And can we do that? I mean, can we have animated light on a staircase? And this was something we we were all sort of questioning in our minds and I kept coming back to the point um, that you know you go outside and as you can see from the image you know the shadows change things are moving vehicles move and create different shadows we don't live in this kind of uniform natural lit environment so why not why why can't we do this um, but just from a safety point of view we decided you know what let's let's just be safe and let's have a maintained minimum illuminance. So we'd always have, say, 10% light on, but then we'd increase the intensity. So you'd always have a level of light, but then we'd overlay that with the intensity, and that's what would give you this kind of uh, contrast within the space. And, yeah, we were really happy. Um, it, it came out <laughs> really, really well. Um, the images 
shatty structure. And you can see the sort of the different intensities of light sort of moving across. Um, and it's really fascinating space to walk through and transition through. And, and it's, it's really, really fun to be in. Um, obviously, don't take my word for it. I'm going to show you a little video at the end here now just to show you how that animated light runs. Fingers crossed. There we go. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> ah, three minutes to go. Excellent. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs>
Thank you. So exactly, today I'm going to speak to you using language, because I can. I mean, because of this ability as humans, we can transmit our ideas across space and time, and I hope that's going to happen now. Um, our ability to communicate doesn't necessarily mean that we always understand each other, even if we speak the same language. It can happen among the stakeholders of a project. Just to pick a random example, lighting design. So normally the owners uh, do not have a vocabulary that allow them to uh, specify a lighting design. Um, maybe the architect has one, uh, but often it's not the same as the engineer, nor as the lighting designer. So all the stakeholders in a project have questions. And what happens is that sometimes the answer can be unsatisfactory due to misunderstandings. Um, for example, if I talk about applying wall grazing to a facade, uh, the architect could think of uh, wall washer, for example. Take uh, light pollution instead. This notion is part of common knowledge. Uh, nowadays, and since the general public started using the appropriate terminology, maybe more, more people have been thinking about it. So, is it possible to learn from this example and improve our communication? Uh, sometimes the relationship between the owner, the architect and me as a lighting designer is based on trust, not on understanding through a common language. So, are you experiencing the same struggle as I do? I'm wondering, what if we started talking about the ceiling as the fifth facade instead? What if we'd compare the ceiling again to a canopy of trees and their different density in foliage as the light passes through? Would the client understand us better then? So, I strongly believe that the way we describe lighting design should make sense for the general public. An easily understandable language could contribute to raise awareness of lighting design and maybe empower our potential clients. I'm very grateful to Kerem, to the journalists, to the marketing people, especially in IALD, who inspire us in communication. Maybe together we can educate our clients while adopting a non-academic vocabulary accessible by everyone. Now, of course, that isn't just English. There are about 7,000 languages spoken around the world. Some linguists think that the language we speak shape the way we think, that the terms we use influence our thoughts, maybe also about light, so, let's give a closer look to words related to light in different languages. The original concept of light referred to what we can experience with our visual sense. At the same time, words for light are very old in the development of language. I'll introduce you to unique, beautiful words today. And please forgive me in advance for my pronunciation. Um, it is true that in linguistic, the link between the terms and their meanings is arbitrary, okay? So this makes even more interesting for me how halo became multilingual, a word that exists in several languages. Other Greek, Greek words like adilia aren't so common, uh, even if many can relate to this uh, glary, overcast sky. Um, here, I'd also like to mention sun sun is a Japanese word um, that stands for a lot of sun rays shining through the clouds. Uh, it's similar to lama di luce in Italian, um, it's like light, bl light blades. Not to be confused with my favorite Japanese word, komorebi, that sunrise filtering through the foliage and casting shadows on the ground. Now, Caustics is an exception, uh, at least for me, it's used in physics to describe the effect of reflection or refraction by a curved surface or object. This is my favorite phenomenon, and after mentioning it uh, a few times, now also my friends uh, use it. 
I love the verb glisten, to shine with a trembling light that gets reflected on a surface, and a variation that's shimmer from Old English shimmering. Uh, it has Germanic origin, and it's related to shimmering, also to shine. Now, look. Many languages have a word for dawn, but only maybe because they only have notturno, literally nocturnal, a song to the night. Only German has a word for the red color of the sky around sunset. It differs from afterglow, that's a broad arch of pinkish sunlight in the sky. In Hungarian, Aranid is a word for the sun that creates a golden bridge. We can't translate it as sun glade, nor as sun pillar. When the moon reflects in the water, in Hungarian you say silver bridge, while in Swedish, mongota is the moon road. Uh, a Japanese word related to this is only used when the moon reflects into a river. You see, in Japan, like this for the bioluminescence of the fireflies. Um, here, I'd also like to mention yakamos. Uh, that's a Turkish word that stands for the bioluminescence of a plankton that's commonly known as a sea sparkle. Um, talking about complexity, the candles in winter, and it's pretty common to do in the Scandinavian countries. Instead, if we travel to the region home to Malayalam, many households practice the ritual of lighting the lamp at night and placing it in front of the main door. For an English speaker, this would rather be to have light in the dark. To a native, the idea of lighting the lamp at night means to cast away all evil forces of the night. Um, and I'd like to take one more moment to talk about candles. Um, in earlier colonial America, uh, homes were often miles apart, and the sight of a candle in a window from a distance was the sign of welcome to those wishing to visit. Rumored as one of the largest consumer of candles per capita, Denmark and other Scandinavian countries have embraced the power of warming glow candlelight. A simple lit candle seen, is seen as one of the most fundamental hygge moments to achieve. Strangely enough, in Swedish and Danish, luz and lis mean both light and candle. Scandinavian culture will need the talk apart. Uh, however, as you might notice if you walk in town, people don't seem particularly interested in curtains aside from their decorative aspects. This differs greatly from where I grew up in Italy. The first Sunday of Advent is the moment when the Christmas decorations come out in force in Scandinavia. The paper stars originated in Germany started to be imported in Sweden in 1930s. Later, the founder of H&M uh, created a cheaper version that was an instant success. The tradition spread quickly and has held fast. My favorite activity since I moved in Sweden is sitting quietly and pondering at task, if you can believe it. Um, it usually involves the privacy and coziness of a summer house and the candles lit at twilight. I find fascinating in Russian the subtle differences between the quantity of light before darkness. They have a word for half-light, dawn of the twilight, the pre-dawn half-darkness, and semi-darkness. And then the winter comes. In Finnish, kamos is the blue color of the sky when the sun does not rise at the horizon, the polar night. A very peculiar situation related to an interesting culture, Icelandic, has a word for describing the situation when there is just enough light to find your way. A Swedish and Finnish are also very intriguing people with the twisted sense of humor, maybe, since they have so many words for describing uh, the very dark night instead of saying pitch black. So many experiences of light 
in different cultures back the question, does the language we speak influence the way we think? Do the words we use influence our thoughts? I think so, as well as our culture, our rituals. We have been talking about daylight since the mankind created later other countries, so light in design language is definitely young, even if compared to architecture. Many architects, like Alvar Aalto in this example, embraced light and daylight as form a giver for the architecture, and Lamp published a gorgeous book, published a gorgeous book about it. You can still find it in many architects' studio. Rich Kelly proposed a very easy lexicon. Not only the three elemental kinds of light, focal glow, ambient luminescence, play of brilliance, but also talking about intensity, brightness, diffusion, spectral color, direction, and motion. So I bet that collaborating with Khan and other architects, he developed a great understanding, not only trust. Kelly have specific qualities attributed to it by the regular occurrence of specific effects, as does the wind. And it demands a trained eye to recognize real and relative values, experience and knowledge of the cultural and physiological effects of light on people, experience and knowledge of physical techniques. Then, then something happened. Why did we stop talking the same language? Did the establishment of lighting design as a profession um, or as a separate dis discipline bring us far from the general public language? So are there solutions? Can we push the evolution of the language? For example, there are evolutionists like Foscop, it's a non-profit think tank uh, that studies light as a focal ethos. Like the Wayne, I do believe that professional practice of architectural lighting design could benefit maybe by having the students look at lighting design through a window framed by language and culture. A better awareness of the, light, the quality of illuminated spaces can be achieved. There is more to light than enabling us to see says Claudia Dotson. The first part of her research investigated cultural ideas of light using language and linguistics as a research tool, as displayed in this very powerful chart. Another, as displayed in this very powerful chart. Another approach could be learning from the food industry that used sensory science to evaluate science to evaluating consumer products. This is the topic of Johanna in consumer products. This is the topic of Johanna Enger's research. The overall objective is to develop definitions and concepts for lighting quality, a basis for methods and tools for evaluation of design of light environments. The purpose of the study is to investigate how a selection of descriptive words is associated with various light qualities in the room. The study also compared the perceived contrast and brightness to the photoreceptor's response to logarithmic light intensity using the environmental light field measurement developed at Lund University. Please get in touch with your next step is to examine closer the link, the link between the language we speak and the way we think, and hopefully give back to those uh, who contributed to my research so far. In fact, I couldn't prepare this presentation without the involvement of so many friends and uh, colleagues who helped me along the way. So, grazie, kitos, gracias, merci, tak, thank you.
Okay, hello everyone. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about a project we recently completed, which is we recently completed, which is called the Disney Reef, and it's at Great Ormond Street Hospital. Um, I'm going to refer to Great Ormond Street Hospital as GOSH. And before they did that, this was a delivery zone in the middle of the hospital, all the way up seven floors, um, with children that have to stay in the hospital sometimes up to six months or even more. Um, so, Great Ormond Street, um, so Great Ormond Street asked Disney to come up with an idea, something for the children to look at from their bedrooms, but also somewhere um, where people could go. So it can be quite a stressful time. Um, the hospital has 600 patients per day, so it's quite a tall order. Um, so Disney, this is an initial sketch from Dis Disney. So they were creating a platform over the delivery area. Um, so this platform was completely built from scratch. Um, and you can look at it from above, from all of the bedrooms. Um, I should call them wards, really, from the wards. And um, so there's some key things that Disney um, came up with that they needed to do as a brief cover area so this is the only area of the garden which is covered so um, obviously this area can be used when it's raining um, they identified that there should be a teen zone so a lot of the things in the hospital that are created are for much younger kids and the hospital came up with this idea that they should have somewhere where teenagers could go because um, it's there's teenagers in the hospital as well um, they wanted a quiet area so um, the pink the pink circle here is um, dedicated quiet zone because they, the hospital asked um, Disney to create an area where kids could go with their family and sit and chat and have a quiet time and not be some quite difficult conversations happening. Um, there should be a lot of seating. Um, Disney wanted to have all of the Disney characters in the garden, so obviously they're paying for this themselves and they want to have every Disney character possible. Um, and also for the children, they see a Disney character, their faces light up, and so we've got to get all the Disney characters in there. Um, quite obvious, but not always done, is that wheelchair access has to be um, for ev everywhere in the hospital. Um, so all of these different elements have um, big space in between them for wheelchairs. Um, and also, around, along the bottom, up the side, and along the top, you can see this sort of spare white zone, and we weren't allowed to put anything around the edges. Um, this is for the window cleaning of those wards. Um, so nothing was actually allowed to touch the side. So this is like completely isolated in the middle. So Disney, uh, this is about the stage when we were brought on to look at the lighting. So Disney created this 3D model. Um, which was fantastic, um, but my initial thoughts were, where, where are we going to put the lights? There's all the Disney characters are in there somewhere. You can see Nemo there and some other little plastic characters in, in the model. Um, we were told that this had to look really good from above and really amazing from within. All of the Disney characters had to be lit um, and that it should just be magical and lots of interesting stuff. But we were also told that we can't put any lights around this one metre zone and nothing can be attached to the buildings. So um, my initial thoughts were, well, where are we going to put the lights? Because if you're lighting a character, you really want to light it from sort of this angle. And there was just no height. There's these, these fronds, as they're called. Um, they didn't have any structure to them. They're just like grass wav wavering around. Um, and the only thing that, um, as a result of that meeting, Disney came up with an amazing idea um, and really, really helpful of them to add this huge feature in for, for the lighting, um, to have a sunken ship in, in the garden. So all of our spotlights and most of the lighting, sunken ship with two enormous masts. And these gave us the opportunity to attach lights to. And you can see on the left-hand side, the top of the mast, and then that bit at the front is, the, is called the bow sprit, and on the front of there we've got more spotlights. Um... So during the light test with the model, um, something really magical happened. Um, I was testing the little spotlights and trying to show them where you're going to put the lights. There's nothing to attack. It shone a shadow of Peter Pan onto the side of the model. And everyone was like, oh, that looks pretty cool. Um, and so we came up with this idea of projecting Peter Pan onto the facade. And this is another way of getting light up into the space where children can see it, but without attaching anything onto the buildings. So this is about 
12 meters high, this projection. Um, and this has become a huge feature of the lighting and the garden and of the hospital itself. Um, the reason being that J.M. Barry used to live right next door to Great Ormond Street Hospital. And I didn't know this, but he was about... In 1929, he gifted the copyright of Peter Pan to Great Ormond Street Hospital. Um, and through this gift, Peter Pan's magic made an unprecedented leap from the realm of fiction into reality. A production of the play was on, as well as from the sale of Peter Pan books and other products. Barry requested that the amount raised for the hospital from Peter Pan never be revealed, and Gosh has always honoured these wishes. Um, so the hospital absolutely delighted with this, and at night time, when all of the other lighting is off, Peter Pan is projected onto the facade, and it just, the children love it. So in the undercover area, um, this is the only area of the garden where you can, you can go if it's bad weather. So we sort of thought that there should be something quite interesting there. Um, so I came up with the idea of having interactive screens. So we've got three different heights for tiny kids, um, wheelchair height and adult height. And then if the weather's really bad, you can stand in the undercover area and there's like some sort of underwater games and stuff that you can play with. Um, and so this is the quiet zone. Um, there, this little coved area um, and all we've got here is two quite a difficult conversation with so the teen zone um, Disney created a separate area at the back of the garden um, dedicated to teenagers they didn't want to have a barrier or a sign that said this is the teen zone so they created an uh, it's called Atlantis basically um, and the Disney movie Atlantis is is sort of all all got this blue um, filter over the movie um, so I decided to light this whole area in blue light to give it a completely visual barrier from the rest of the garden. So there's no bright colours, it's just blue. Um, and it just works really well. There's no sign saying it's a teen zone, but they've got lots of like seating inside and it's all blue. And, and basically the teenagers just go and hang out there. And there's no characters in that area, it's completely different. So it's worked out really well. <coughs> So the Disney characters are all dotted around the garden. This is just a few of them, but they've all got spotlights coming from above. And the spotlights are sort of narrow to medium beam, and they're pin-spotting each of the characters. Um, and this is something that Disney really, really wanted, because the characters are so important, and they all look absolutely amazing with individual spotlights on either of them, each of them. Um, the bow spit at the front of the ship <clears throat> that's the bit that comes out of the front of a ship. And so they've got this lantern hanging off the end of it. Um, and so we decided to put like a it. And we also used the opportunity to have some more spotlights. So in the bottom half of the lantern um, is another chain as well. So it's like a really good opportunity to get basically. And finally, these are the only other elements that are on overnight. So this is something that looks really amazing from above. So it's fiber optics, <coughs> two different applications. So on the left-hand side, we've got these treasure chests um, with an amber filter, and the, the, the treasure sort of sparkles with fibers. And on the right-hand side is the top of the clamshell, which is shrouding the quiet zone. And this has got... Um, fiber optics all the way across the top of it and they follow the line of the clam. So when you're looking down from the wards above, it actually looks like a clam shell. It's amazing. Um, so both of these just shimmer at night and it just looks really magical from above. Um, so that's it. And I'm just going to show you two short videos um, from, the, um, from the hospital. Mm, how do I play? <laughs> When we're in hospital, we tend to be in for. When we're in hospital, we tend to be in for.
somewhere to hang out with my friends and family and other people in the hospital. And there's one more. Can still use a TV screen. If you have sensory needs, there's lots of different lights and different colours, there's lots to touch, different textures and lots of space as well to get around. Our children and young people told us that they wanted an area where it was quiet and chilled out, uh, especially when it's so busy on the wards so that they could take themselves away from those areas. It's an amazing space and I think it's brilliant and I absolutely love it and I'm sure our children and young people Okay, um, welcome back to the next session. It's great that there's actually so many people coming down here and listening live while we're